Okay, well, welcome everyone to tonight's Civic Academy. Um, I want to just begin by acknowledging that we are all meeting tonight on Aboriginal land. Um, so I'm here in South Brisbane on the lands of the Yagara and Turbul people. Um, and I would just invite you all to take a moment to um, just write in the chat whose land you're on. Um, all across Queensland, we are all on Aboriginal land. I also just wanted to um, acknowledge the Wangan and Jagalingu people who are right now uh, fighting for their country in central Queensland um, and have been fighting for their country for quite some time now, um, but the fight is really kicking off at the moment. Um, and I invite you to, to look at that um, if you haven't already uh, seen it. Uh, so just to kick off, I wanted to share our aims um, for this evening. So we've got three aims this evening and for all of our civic academies. Um, the first is to develop the policy and technical knowledge among Alliance leaders um, and in Alliance institutions, right? So it's important that uh, we as engaged civil society leaders understand um, policy to some extent. Um, and so these are a bit of a, an opportunity for all of you to learn a bit more and develop that understanding and knowledge and to share, it, to share that back within your organisation as well. We also want to build on our Maroon Print vision and principles for Queensland reconstruction. So I've got a link to the Maroon Print in the chat there, um, but that is something that we as um, the Queensland Community Alliance and the member organisations of the Alliance kind of pulled together as kind of guiding principles and the vision for Queensland reconstruction that we think will lead to a situation where Queensland is um, in a position that looks after Queenslanders. Um, and so we need to develop that into some more concrete policy and we're in the process of doing that. And so part of, part of doing that is, is these civic academies. Um, we also want to increase the ambition and imagination around public policy, right? So um, there's different kind of levels of how we think about policy, but we want to have um, at chase ambitious goals as the Alliance um, that will mean that we have a Queensland that looks after Queenslanders, um, where everyone has work and shelter, um, that you know, people are not discriminated against in the street uh, and that our community infrastructure is well funded. I also just realised I haven't introduced myself properly, so my name is Emily Kane and I'm a community organiser with the Queensland Community Alliance. Um, and I will be chairing this session this evening. I'd like to invite Brett Kerrison from Logan Anglican um, to share a story about work from his family. Yeah, um, my daughter uh, Emma is uh, 24 years old and suffers from depression. Um, this affects uh, her drive, her initiative uh, and her confidence, <laughs> which, which really affects every area of her life. Um, Emma's not had a full-time permanent job since finishing school in 2013. Uh, she has worked as a casual at Big W for six years, where she got about 10 hours a week work. Um, and then from August last year, she worked for about five months uh, with the Queensland Government in a temporary job. She resigned from Big W um, in the hope that the, the, Queensland, the, the government job would lead to something else in the government, but unfortunately that didn't eventuate. Then, um, so that, that job ended in about at the end of January and then COVID struck, <laughs> um, which really has demolished the job market um, and also increased the number of people who are applying uh, for the very limited vacancies that are available. And I fear for her future because um, how is she going to look after herself? Um, you know, where, how is she going to live um, if she doesn't have a job, if she doesn't get sufficient work? Um, she can't buy a car. You know, she can't rent her own house or, or place to live, the unit. Um, she can't make plans for the future. Uh, without um, a, a decent job, a, a preferably a full-time, well-paid job. So, you know, we, we need an economic reconstruction that provides permanent full-time work and gives our young people a viable future. 
because um, I want them to thrive. <laughs> I don't want them to be uh, depressed and, um, you know, looking at a bleak future or, or thinking their future is going to be bleak. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Brett. Um, I now want to hand over to Laura Barnes. So Laura has almost 20 years experience in workforce planning and development and labour market slash employment programs and policy. Uh, she's worked with both government and industry to develop labour supply strategies to increase participation and productivity and labour demand strategies to support industry development. Most recently, she's been working across the breadth of social policy and supporting community-led strategies for social change. So Laura is going to tell us a bit about uh, what's going on in the labour market um, and I'd like to invite her to speak now. Thank you, Emily. That's um, a lovely introduction. Um, and thank you, Brett, for sharing your story and um, your daughter's story. Unfortunately, um, through this pandemic and, and before indeed, it is a story that um, is way too common um, for many young people and has absolutely been exacerbated um, by the pandemic. Um, before I start, go much further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on as well um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Australia Together, just for a bit of context more than anything else. So Australia Together is an, um, an alliance of civil society organisations. So there's about uh, seven of us in, um, that are alliance partners and about another 25 organisations that have signed up to our summit statements. Um, and I guess um, Australia Together came together exactly as you were saying, Brett, because there are belief that um, we need a reconstruction plan uh, post-COVID and that this is not the time to return to normal. There's actually, while um, the pandemic has been devastating for so many people, there's opportunity here to build back better is our kind of catch cry. So we've um, come up with some, we have, there was a summit in the beginning of July and now we've come up with some summit statements in the budget submission um, calling for national leadership but importantly, community-led delivery of programs and, and services and, and the reconstruction effort. And then we're also talking about what we think are three critical areas for wellbeing. Um, and I think you've touched beautifully, Brett, on, on why jobs are so important and why that's one of our key elements. It is a critical um, element to, as you said, income, being able to afford houses, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, our other two elements are early childhood and housing. So that's just a very little bit of background. So how uh, now to get into the, the nitty gritty of the labour market, I guess, and the employment status. I mean, I don't think I need, you don't need me here to tell you um, the impact that the COVID pandemic has had upon jobs. Yeah, we've all seen the lines um, on Centrelink and seen the headlines. Um, many, many people have lost their jobs, many of whom had not found themselves unemployed before. Um, for that, whom it is a new experience, um, but many too who, uh, who, who have been in and out of employment. The way we've been kind of thinking about, and it might be useful to frame this um, this way for you guys as well, is that really the pandemic has had three, imp three different impacts on employment. Now, the first is the immediate impact of restrictions, yeah, of lockdown um, and, and all of the restrictions that came with that that had an immediate impact of dropping demand for a whole bunch of goods and services. We couldn't go to cafes, we couldn't go to pubs. Uh, international tourists were no longer coming. As a result, you know, that's when we saw that immediate impact um, as people um, formed lines around Centrelink and, and et cetera. Um, so that's the, um, and, and in that, there was also significant groups, many of them young and, and vulnerable workers who were significantly impacted. And the government responded quite well through JobKeeper, which mitigate, mitigated some of those impacts, but not all. Um, and, and particularly some of those vulnerable workers on temporary visas have not been covered and casuals haven't been covered by that. And so there's longer term impacts for those guys. So first impact is the amount immediate impact of um, restrictions. The second impact is and the resulting economic downturn. 
So already before the pandemic um, investment, you know, to use technical terms, non-mining business investment was weak. Um, but at, it is expected, it obviously has gotten a lot worse thanks to COVID and is expected to continue for much longer. Private sector employers are going to be, um, understandably, hesitant about investing in their businesses, about investing in jobs, about making um, significant changes to the way they do their business. They're going to be really looking at their bottom line and in many ways, in many instances, really seeing some struggles for themselves in that too. So there's going to be an economic downturn through the medium and the longer term that will have an impact on employment as well. The third um, impact though, however, and is that um, is the structural changes um, in the in the labour market that have been created or accelerated by the pandemic? And in my view, I think many of the impacts on the labour market have actually been the exposing of weaknesses in our labour market prior to the pandemic. They are things like um, increased precarious work, so increased casualisation, the gig economy, um, um, you know, those kind of structures. And, and therefore the challenges that that's brought into COVID. Underemployment, um, people working not enough hours or wanting to work more hours in many cases. Um, youth unemployment um, was already not great prior to the uh, COVID pandemic, but has absolutely been exacerbated um, and will continue to. And I guess the other thing we also really, so there's those three things. So immediate impact of restrictions, um, short, medium term economic downturn, and then the longer term structural changes to the, to, to the labour market. Um, the other thing I would say is the impact of the COVID pandemic um, on employment and on the labour market has been uneven across regions. Um, so it hasn't impacted on every community the same. And that's why for Australia Together, um, we, t we think there's a need for a very strong community led focus in the work in, of reconstruction, because there's no not going to be a one size fits all um, strategy for this. Um, and as we get, uh, uh, as I talk a bit further on, I think particularly in the area of jobs, um, where jobs labour markets are are spatial, right? People don't travel hundreds of kilometres, FIFO workers, I guess, accepted. But for the most part, people live and work within a community and want to find work in that community. Um, so, uh, yeah, and as I said, not all communities have been impacted similarly um, by, by COVID. In Queensland communities, like I think I heard some people from Cairns, Townsville, the tourism communities have been hit incredibly hard. Um, uh, other communities, um, you know, m may be wearing it a little better due to other industries that have been able to keep going through, through um, the pandemic. Um, so I guess a lot of that though is about those three impacts and that is about um, demand. So labor's, labor demand. There have been some changes to labor supply as well and that have been, you know, that I think we need to also understand. Um, and one of those has been a lot of workers withdrawing from the labor market. Um, not all of them voluntarily, but for a, a couple of different reasons. Um, one might be isolation or quarantine and the need to, to withdraw from the labour market due to exposure to COVID or indeed illness. And we've seen the impact of that on uh, in the aged care sector, uh, particularly in Melbourne, where um, there are reports that up to 80% of the workers in age, some aged care facilities have had to withdraw from work. Um, and we also saw the impact of school and childcare closures on labour market participation, particularly for women. Um, who, who then had to undertake um, extra home care duties, extra child care duties. Um, and as a result, some have chosen to withdraw from the labour market. I think the other thing to note in terms of the impact um, of uh, COVID on the labour market is, um, it, it is it's affecting industries differently. Um, so we've seen some industries growing in employment while some industries are declining in employment. So what we will find is what's called a, uh, uh, a structural mismatch or a skills mismatch where the people who are losing their jobs will not necessarily have the skills and experience 
um, that they need to get the jobs in industries that will grow, that are growing now and or will continue to grow as we recover and indeed hopefully renew out of the pandemic. So that's a kind of overview of where we think we are. Things have not turned out quite as badly as we thought, but nonetheless, Queen, um, Federal Treasury at the moment is still predicting an effective unemployment rate by the end of the year in the vicinity of 13%. Um, that will be different across regions and across um, states and territories, of course. Um, but currently, Queensland is not faring particularly well um, with the second lowest jobs growth, um, such as it is out of all the states and territories. Um, you know, things will change as the COVID pandemic continues to, to, um, uh, to impact on communities and on states more than others, but that's where we're kind of at, at the moment. The bottom line for me out of all of that is, um, as so often happens, it is the most vulnerable in our labour market that have been the most affected. Uh, it is young people, it is um, people on temporary visas, it is the low skilled, it is those relying on casual or, or gig economy jobs um, that have been the most affected. Um, those that are lucky enough to have full-time jobs that they can do from home, you know, for, for um, to, to a reasonable extent have been able to continue. So what do we know needs to happen now? Um, the first thing is, and particularly if we don't want people to end up into cycles of long-term unemployment, is really the critical piece here. Um, and the best thing, to, the best way to avoiding long-term unemployment is, believe it or not, a job. <laughs> um, which you know sounds silly, but you know in the homelessness space they say, what's what you know, and we've seen from the Nordic countries, how do you prevent homelessness or or, or solve homelessness? You give people homes, yeah, with support. Um, and the same could be said for jobs. How do you prevent long-term joblessness um, is you provide people with work um, and support if necessary, um, where necessary, um, to ensure they can do that, uh, that work the best they can. There's a term in the labour market world called labour labor market scarring. Um, and it happens particularly for young people, but indeed for anyone. Um, periods and the longer the period out of work, the greater the... Um, scarring that happens and the long-term impacts. So the, um, the prevention is the way we need to get people back into work as quickly as possible, make sure we are not allowing individuals and particularly young people, and I will keep saying and emphasising young people through this, we need to get them back into work as quickly as possible to prevent those scarring impacts of long-term unemployment. Because one pe once people enter into a, a period long-term unemployed, then it becomes increasingly difficult for people to find work. Um, and the supports that are needed um, are a different set of supports. Um, an effective support, you know, for the long-term unemployed is really very much tailored to the individual need and individual circumstances. Um, as you said so eloquently, Brett, you know, without a job, it's hard to find, um, it's hard to pay your bills, it's hard to um, put a, keep a roof over your head. Um, it also has impacts on your mental health or can um, have impacts on, on your physical health um, and, and et cetera. So often when people have been out of the labour market for a while, there are a range of those wraparound supports that people need to address those barriers to employment and or support people to be the best they can be in the labour market. Um, some of the things that can be included in that kind of wraparound support is work readiness. So learning again how to be in the workplace um, and understanding the nature of work in the workplace, particularly as I say, if you haven't been in the workforce for a long time or if you haven't been in the workforce for a while and your last sort of employment was in a different industry or a different uh, environment, then you need to understand and learn about the new industry, the new environment you're going into. It might include things like literacy and numeracy, upskilling, up training. Um, but for me, that training needs to be connected to work. Yeah, training for training sake has some benefits. It does certainly. We all know the adage about keeping the mind active, you know, keeps you young and, and those kind of things. So there are some benefits to, to straight skilling. But if we're really to support people who have been unemployed for long periods of time, that skilling needs to be connected to a real job. 
so they can see um, an outcome and they are training for, for that work experience. Um, and as I say, there may be also mental health, physical health, disability support issues that may need to come into play as well um, over long term. Um, uh, uh, yeah, to support people to come out of long term unemployment. I think that connection to jobs piece is really important. And I think that's, again, where we come back to community led strategies and working in community um, so that you understand. So the job seeker can understand uh, or can be supported to understand where the jobs are in their local community. Um, you know, there's no point applying for a mining job if you're going, living in um, Harvey Bay, for example, FIFO notwithstanding, but that is a whole other, other kettle of fish. But, you know, understanding where the jobs growth is going to be in your community, being supported to do the training and the, get the wraparound support that you need to be able to access those jobs is, is the most important thing. Sorry, Laura, we're just going to have to wrap it up. Um, in, in a moment. Okay, I always talk too much. I'm very sorry. Um, so the other thing I guess I would say is I think there's also support for employers that's required in some of this as well. So working with employers. So what we're really clearly saying is what we need right now with the federal government, um, we've called on the federal government, is in this short term, private sector demand for most regions in most communities is not going to be sufficient to provide people with the jobs they need right now. And, and what we need to do to make sure people get back to work quickly before that labour market scarring comes into play. So we've been calling on uh, federal government to fund public sector job creation um, directly. We're also calling for support and we believe uh, that we need um, local jobs plans. So all of the um, players in the labour market, training providers, community sector, um, etc., come together to, to, create, to create that local jobs plan, including jobs targets inside that jobs plan. And so then everyone can work to a common vision and a common target uh, for supporting people in that community to get back to work. This is possible. It's been done before. It's being done in Victoria at the moment. They're working with the community sector, local government um, and a few others to do the direct job creation. They're boosting their youth intake in the Victorian public se sector. Um, we've got programs in Queensland like Skilling Queensland is for Work and its predecessor, Breaking the Unemployment Cycle, that have been extraordinarily successful and really are best practice uh, programs for how to get people back to work through through troubles like this. Thanks, Laura. I better stop, hey? <laughs> <laughs> it's also good. Um, <laughs> I think we need to leave it there. Um, okay. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, so we're just going to hear from uh, Kate Flanders now. Uh, so Kate Flanders is the Assistant Secretary of Together. Um, she's worked within the union movement as an industrial officer, an organiser, lead organiser, trainer and director of industrial services before being elected as the Assistant Secretary of the QPSU, which uh, is what Together was called before it was called Together. Um, so I spoke to Kate yesterday and I've just got a recorded message from her. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Flanders. I work at the Together Union and we're a union of majority public sector workers, but also workers in airlines and travel, universities and general clerical. So thanks for having me along tonight by video. I'm self-isolating today because I had a COVID test yesterday and some of the people who were involved in that, well, all of them are public sector workers. So I'm here to talk to you about this ask in our election strategy as the Alliance. Here in Queensland, the group of workers who've been most impacted by the economic downturn are actually young people. And in Queensland, the biggest group are women between the ages of 25 to 34. And they're most heavily affected by loss of employment. Women more generally have been um, affected by the downturn and more women have lost jobs or hours as a result of the economic downturn. So while um, every level of government is trying to create more employment, um, the employment in traditionally male-dominated industries is not going to be able to fill the gap that we need right now. So many of our members who work in the airlines industry are now looking for different roles and different opportunities. And something that we think um, is an essential part of this role is, or an essential gap, um, is making sure that we have enough public sector workers. Public sector workers in the majority are women um, and there are many opportunities, ways you can serve your community as a public servant. 
So when you think of a public servant, what do you think of? I'm sure you're all sitting there thinking maybe um, of someone who wears a suit and works in One William Street, but that's actually not a real public servant. <laughs> they are, they are some of those people, but they're rare. So the public servants I think of are the schools officer at my local school, the administration officer when I first walk in and um, talk to them whenever she rings me to say your, your daughter is sick. The child safety officers who look after our most vulnerable um, children, people who work in national parks, people who work at your local um, Department of Housing Service Centre, people who help you get your licence at the Department of Transport and Main Roads. These are people are all public servants and they work in every corner of our great state. So something that even the Queensland Productivity Commission has recommended as a strategy to get us out and through COVID-19 is to create more employment in every part of Queensland. And that includes making sure that we have equity and access to services. And how we get more equitable access to services is having more public servants in the places where we need them. So if we need another housing service centre um, in Cairns or the far north, then we should build one and employ public servants to help run it. Um, and if we need um, more park rangers up there on the Great Barrier Reef or more people working in child protection, then we can employ those people and they can be all across our great state. Um, so it's really important that we think about the services that these workers provide. So even things like transport and main roads, classic example. So on the border at the moment, of course, there's Queensland Police, but there's also transport inspectors working down there and they work for transport and main roads. The people who make sure we get our driver's licenses during COVID-19, you couldn't go and get a driving test, it was too close. So there's a lot of young people, um, a lot of migrants, a lot of women who've been practicing and practicing and waiting to get their license and they haven't been able to in their shutdown period. And so if we had some more driving examiners, we could go out there and help people access um, their license, then that would be something else we could do. The other key area, of course, is Queensland Health. So Queensland is doing better through the COVID crisis because we have great public health services. So we really don't want to see um, a backward step in terms of health services to our community. And in fact, we want to see more equitable access to health services because what quality of healthcare you get shouldn't be determined by your postcode. So we want to make sure that the government is really looking at what health services they can offer everywhere across the state and improving those services and making sure that public servants are employed to actually deliver them. So your allied health workers, your psychologists, your um, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, they're all public servants and they do a great job. So we are encouraging every leader um, and every activist to consider asking not just for a uh, tradie led recovery, or for a focus on manufacturing, but actually a focus on services and the workers who provide those services. And we think that the public sector um, is a place that we should focus on um, as an alliance and as a community um, and actually celebrate the work that public servants do. Um, and that's at both a state government level and also at a local government level because our local councils deliver so many essential services. You know, it's obviously our um, incredible libraries, you know, places where people can access resources. Um, we've also got um, all of our garbage and refuse services, water, you know, all these essential things we need to live healthy and safe lives. So state and local government are key. Um, I should also point out that actually federal government is key. So Centrelink has had to employ more people during the COVID crisis to support people on JobKeeper and JobSeeker. And we should encourage the federal government at a later stage, obviously not this state election, but it's important that we have access to those services when we need them as well. So that's my, my pitch in support of this great ask that's been come up with by your Leaders Council. I think it's a really good idea. Um, the data and the research backs it up. Um, Together's been getting some great economic data from the Centre for Future Work um, and also per capita that speaks to the need to really focus on services um, and employment in the public sector. So thank you very much for your time. To now take a different tact, I'm going to share a video which uh, shares a story from a campaign from the UK about a living wage. Um, so there are actually kind of two, two pieces to this, uh, you know, puzzle around jobs-based stimulus. Uh, one is actually jobs, um, but the other, the other piece is actually income in and of itself. And so 
I'm just going to share another video now um, that isn't directly related, but kind of fills in a different piece of the puzzle. So I'll just do that. Imagine this. You have to get up before dawn to catch two buses to work. You put in a full day, then catch another two buses home. And the reason you take the bus is because you can't afford to take the tube. Even though it would save you three hours a day in travel, your kids are asleep when you leave home and they're asleep when you get back. And this is happening here, now. That's why we launched the Living Wage Campaign. Our aim is to make sure people earn enough so that they don't have to do two or three jobs. No one on the living wage is going to get rich, but it does mean that those families won't live in poverty. For example, Sandra Sanchez, whose story we started with, needs to earn just an extra 90 pence an hour. She could then get the tube and spend more time with her family. And we've been making great progress over the last 10 years. Abdul Jaram was a cleaner for HSBC on the minimum wage. Then he joined our campaign. We went to the shareholders meeting where Abdul got up and said, we work in the same office, but live in different worlds. Abdul's speech won the living wage for all the cleaning staff at HSBC. You see, we can make a difference to people's lives. So please join our campaign, because when you pay someone the living wage, it's about more than just the money. It's about a life worth living. We're now moving towards the kind of solutions end of the evening. And so I would like to introduce Devitt Kennedy uh, to take us through some, some of the solutions that we're advocating for as the Alliance. Yeah, everyone. Um, so my name is David Kennedy. I'm the lead organizer for for the Alliance. Um, and so we have um, we'll be having an assembly with the uh, the plan is with the premier and the opposition leader. Um, and we are waiting for a final confirmation from the premier, but that's likely to be the 14th of September. Um, so three weeks from yesterday. Um, uh, and so what I think Emily discussed at the, at the start, we, the part of the purpose of these academies is to, uh, for us to have enough detail and understanding about the, the proposals that we'll be negotiating in that assembly, um, which it's a negotiation space with each of them about what they can commit to. Um, and so we need to have enough understanding of, of those things that we're trying to negotiate on to be able to explain it to the other people that you're trying to bring along. Um, but also when you go back, so, you know, the people that are coming from your mosque or your union or your community center, um, and so on. Um, so the two, um, proposals, um, that we have now that Emily's going to share the slides for that go directly, um, to this issue. Um, so the first that Kate has spoken to a fair bit is around create direct public employment through state and local government, particularly targeting those who've lost jobs and hours in the pandemic um, and creating 3000 jobs in state and local government um, with a hundred million dollar package. Um, so we've heard from Kate about and as well as from Laura about the people who've most, most affected and most lost jobs and lost hours in the pandemic are not the, necessarily the people that current um, stimulus proposals will create roles for and that, um, that skills mismatch that Laura spoke of. So um, I guess initially we said in our Maroon print, we said we wanna see government stimulus spending. And now, now we're saying, okay, um, we're actually seeing seeing that both from um, the government and the opposition leader in the state level. We are seeing stimulus spending being announced, but now let's look at the gaps. And the gaps are quite clearly that that uh, while construction and manufacturing based um, stimulus is welcome um, and and does have a value in getting um, money quickly flowing in the economy, 
there is this significant missing piece of it's not targeting the people who um, who've been most impacted. So we are suggesting for the reasons that Laura and Kate have outlined direct public sector employment, both through the state government and through local government. And Kate ran through a wide range of those types of roles that, that it might be in terms of um, schools officers through to librarians, through to people in transport and main roads, um, uh, teacher aides doing uh, additional, being able to provide additional tutoring um, for education catch up, um, housing service centres, um, people in national parks, people in council run childcare in regional areas in Queensland. Um, so a really wide gamut of, of uh, skills and roles that could be targeted into. Um, I won't say a whole lot more on that because I think the background to that's been really um, well developed by the by the people who've spoken before me and I'll leave more time for questions that people have got. Um, the other part that we really want to pick up and our, all of our asks in in this are not just responding to the pandemic they're, they're responding to the listening campaign that we've we've done uh, which was prime predominantly pre-pandemic but then with with some rapid response listening um, since the the COVID impacts have hit. Um, and actually, uh, um, you know, we hear so many stories about um, wage theft, about underpayment, about um, non-payment of wages, um, and the way that wage, um, like inequality, where, where, where wages are, are slipping behind the standard of living. Um, we, we saw the video from the UK about a living wage foundation. So, uh, sorry, about a living wage campaign. So the living wage has been really successfully developed by campaign, by, by alliances like ours um, in the UK is the most successful example. There's six and a half thousand businesses that now pay the living wage. Um, it's set each year calculated by an independent body. Um, it's, it's over, it's above the, um, the, the legal minimum um, and um, it includes some really big companies um, from HSBC, the bank that was in the video through to at the moment they're really targeting um, universities and Premier League soccer clubs. So Everton now pays the, the living wage and they're, they're, they're targeting a, a number of others. Um, this has also been successful in New Zealand. Um, and so we think it, it can have a role here in Queensland. Industrial relations in Australia is pretty different to those other countries um, in terms of having a, a strong minimum wage that is set by government. Um, and so the living wage idea would need some adaptation in Queensland. It would need to be, we'd need to do some modeling and some research and um, some design work about how would you transfer that kind of um, idea to our context. And so the support we're looking for is essentially seed funding, which is uh, providing funding for three, um, three years um, to be able to do that feasibility and modeling work. Um, and really it is about saying that the um, the, the connection between civil society and um, the market needs to be rebuilt. Um, there's a failure of the market and a failure of regulation when we just rely on the government to fix that. Um, and so one of the ways that this could work um, is you, you, you try and create create a, a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. Um, so for example, if you were to get, at the moment, if you're a, if you're a um, hospitality um, business in say West End in Brisbane, um, you know that the person either side of you are underpaying people, so you have no incentive to pay them properly. Um, if, you, if we were able to do living wage with a, a precinct organizing approach, which is um, our leaders and our community organizations in the West End area getting every business on that street signed up to a living wage. It creates the incentive that, okay, now 
everyone's doing it properly rather than everyone's doing it wrong. So I might as well do it wrong. So that's the idea behind it. Um, but there's a, there's a bunch of work both on the uh, academics, uh, like on the on the economic modelling and on the um, campaign design that that would have to be done. So we're looking for some seed funding for that. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you, David. Um, so now we've got a few minutes for a couple of questions, um, both to Laura and David. So I might just uh, give you a few seconds to think about whether you have. Uh, any questions? And if you do have questions, pop them in the chat. So when you're thinking about what you might want to, what, what what's kind of mulling over in your mind, think about having a conversation with somebody in your community group or in your church or in your workplace um, and think about, you know, what questions might you get from them that you might not be able to answer. Because um, as Devitt said earlier, like the, the purpose of this is um, for all of you to understand enough about these policies to be able to um, you know, engage well and negotiate with us uh, in the in the assembly with the premier and opposition leader in a couple of weeks' time. So, um, are there any questions that anyone has? Do you want to just put them in the, in, in the chat? Or oh, Helen, I saw your hand and uh, go for it. You can just ask. But uh, David, my question is to you, and I also address this in the in the group. Whilst I understand, um, so we heard that. Um, this is about the skills gap, I guess. We heard that the most vulnerable people are women between the ages of 25 and 34 and, um, and our youth. Uh, so how do we transition them or get them into education, uh, back into public sector roles in the short to medium term so that we don't have that long-term market scarring um, that was discussed by Laura. Um, we spoke about, in our group, we spoke about, um, you know, the, the behind the scenes stuff as far as um, uh, commercial and industrial um, construction work goes, but how do we do that? How do we model that when we've got a skills deficit, particularly if we're looking at airline workers or uh, child youth workers uh, in childcare centres, or even the, the the kid that was working at Macca's. How do we look at those and how do we educate them? Because there's no transferable skills there to actually stimulate or motivate. Thanks, Helen. David, do you wanna have a crack at that? Um. Yeah, briefly, but um, uh, like my answer is mainly stolen from from Laura's work, so um, I might flick it on to her. <laughs> um, uh, so um, we're 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 suggesting that the the um, the breaking the unemployment cycle initiative uh, from Queensland in the early two thousands um, provides a possible model, and so that 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 public sector employment program that it created 11,000 positions in 2001 too. Um, and so we, we think that that's a, that's a, a model to, to use. Um, and so of those, um, like 61% were women and, and 76% were young people. Um, so I guess, um, if I understand it right, Laura, like that, those, those positions that might not be like that, that'd be 12 months at least, but they might not be long, long term, but they provide the bridge. They provide the, the connection for to like to the labor market to reduce that scarring. Um, but I'll, I'll stop giving my, um, my um, understanding and def defer to the real expert. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's beautifully said, David. I think the only thing I would add is there's a lot to be learned from traineeship and apprenticeship models that have been extraordinarily successful in providing both skills and work experience and and skills in a workplace yeah so not just you don't just learn it from a book but you you use those skills um so you know i think there's a lot to be learned from traineeship and apprenticeship models that have traditionally succeeded in those male dominated industries for the most part 
um, and a lot of particularly community services sector does not have a great um, uh, tradition of using traineeship and apprenticeship models, nor really does the public sector anymore, although they used to. They used to be the primary employer of particularly apprenticeships. Um, so I think it's about going back to some of that time for the public sector and in the community sector is starting to think about how we can use those traineeship and apprenticeship models effectively for us in that services area. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. And with public sector funding, with something like, you know, some subsidies available to support that employment as well. Thanks, Ellen and Laura and Devitt. Um, there are no more questions in the chat. And so I um, might just move us towards the, the wrap so that we can uh, finish on time. Devitt, are you trying to say something? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I probably should just say a couple of things on, on, the, on the politics. Um, so I think like, um, so both Kate and Laura had referred to that really a large part of this job creation role should like, there, there definitely is a role for state government, but the, the big funding of it really would ideally sit with the federal government. Um, but we think that, that the state government has a responsibility to, Act for Queenslanders and for Queensland employment in the, in this kind of situation. Um, we think that that um, of all of it, all, of all of our of our asks, and for those of you who've been coming every week, we're up to kind of week four of um, going through those details. Um, this is, this one around the the public sector employment is, is probably the most unlikely to succeed, the most difficult. Um, uh, you know, the, the um, debt reduction plan by the current government, the current Labor government means that um, an unfilled AO2 position in the public service now has to go through the um, cabinet budget review committee to get filled, um, which is like uh, essentially makes it impossible, close to impossible to, to, to do. Um, so the, they would turn around and say, yeah, we'll fund, we'll, we'll, we'll create, you know, all of these new positions when we're not really filling the ones that we, um, you know, where someone just resigns or retires um, is not all that likely. And it's, it's similar with the, uh, with the LNP, um, the, the, um, sorry, my, Green just froze. Um, the, the rules that they're putting on themselves around um, fiscal management um, uh, means that, that, that it's probably unlikely. So um, it's, that's not a reason not to, not to push for it, but I think that that needs to be like in, uh, as the people who are putting our thought into understanding this, we want to understand the policy as well as understand the politics. And, and part of that is that this is one of the more more, more difficult ones. Um, but also probably means that we need to build more power to be able to make these kind of changes. Um, and so we're keen to do that and keen to think about who else needs to be um, part of our, our coalition to be able to um, affect those kind of changes. Cool, thanks, Derek. Um, and I'll hopefully see you next week uh, at the same time, same, same time, so, sort of same place, different Zoom link um, uh, for the Welcoming New Queenslanders uh, webinar, um, Civic Academy. Uh, that's next week. So can I just uh, add an extra plug for into the next week is it's, it's really important that we have um, that we have a, a, a wide group of people who are standing beside and with and in solidarity with um, our, our migrant leaders when we talk about welcoming new Queenslanders and when we talk about the, the particular issues that, that those communities are facing, um, that, that it's not just them talking to each other, which they have lots of other opportunities to do, but that this is a moment to broaden that out. So um, looking forward to seeing many of you at that. Cool, thank you. And thanks to Laura for joining us and Kate for recording her message as well. Thanks everyone, have a good night.